Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. This afternoon, I want to show you a faded snapshot from the album of Canadian cultural history. Let us restore its luster together. The history of the group, which was active in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan from 1970 to 1972, has been relegated to the background of a somewhat better known entity, the Photographer's Gallery, one of the first parallel galleries or artist-run spaces in Canada. The Photographer's Gallery was incorporated in 1973 and operated under that name for 30 years until its 2003 merger with Video Verité a media access center, henceforth to be known as Paved Arts. The Photographer's Gallery was an important center, not just regionally but nationally, as an exhibition space, a publication house, a reference library, and surprisingly, a collection. With the help of a provincial grant, the Photographer's Gallery began to acquire work by purchase and donation in 1977 developing a permanent collection of 970 photographic works, which has recently been donated to the Mendel Art Gallery along with the gallery's research library. There is some small irony in this final resting place for the Photographer's Gallery collection, as the organization of Saskatoon's photographers into the group was sparked by the Mendel's refusal to show potentially controversial photographic work James Lizitza's photographs of Quebec taken during the FLQ crisis. The group refers to an organization of like-minded photographers living in and around Saskatoon who formed a cooperative to show their work, which they saw as a legitimate art form and a tool of socio-political engagement. No manifestos were signed, numbers are sketchy, but there appear to have been about 10 active members, some having met at the University of Saskatchewan where they had participated in a variety of activities, including photography, reporting for the, or sorry, involving photography, reporting for the campus newspaper, promoting live theater, and editing the university yearbook. The connectedness of the group functioned on different levels, public and private, professional and familial. They were practicing photographers, they were also friends and sometimes couples. My abstract stresses this point because references to the group never fail to mention two couples, Sylvia Jonescu Lizitza and James Lizitza, Sandra Semchuk and Richard Holden. When I interviewed Sandra and Sylvia, they were quick to correct me, at which point my education really began. Since I was dogged on questions of power relations within families and organizations, and my paper draws out some of the significant, though um, still, sorry, again, Still, I was dogged. I just saw the word dog, I got very anxious. Still, I was dogged on questions of power relations within families and organizations, and my paper draws out some of the significant, though less decisive moments of gender politics, interpersonal relations, personal growth, and the expression of these stages in photographs. My interest in the photographer's gallery is of long standing. My curiosity about the group was sparked by the theme of this conference, Imagining History, and specifically two of its research questions, which stories are still to be told, what gaps and omissions would frame such a history from its margins. These sorts of questions, framed as central to a collective inquiry, may also prompt us to challenge the traditional hierarchical division of the cultural map into center and periphery, or metropolis and region. The usual way uh, derives from our writing of institutional history, which is essentially Darwinian, that is biological and triumphalist. In this familiar mode, the history of an institution is the plotting along a timeline of tiny victories, then major gains, as the institution in formation comes into its moment of promise and passes a series of externally imposed tests of viability to achieve approval, funding, and other forms of authority. Members might start out as a group, or in this case, the group, but their desire for official recognition, the incorporation of the photographer's gallery, imposed a hierarchical structure. There had to be a president, a treasurer, a secretary. Stepping stones to institutional stability, a kind of corporate mimicry, eroded the cooperative spirit of the group, 
Seven years after the incorporation of the photographer's gallery, director Patrick Close was bemoaning the presence of, quote, parasitic members who want to use the gallery's facilities and name and give nothing in return, end quote. These people were an affront to the founders, but the kind of cooperative organization that they had envisioned was difficult, if not impossible, to maintain. Remaining true to the spirit of the group meant hacking it out, making a life in the arts, keeping the faith of this generation, for the oldest member of this foursome was born in 1946, the youngest in 1949. When I first visited the photographer's gallery in the early 80s, there was not a trace of the group. Janestia Lizitza explains that there was something of an exodus at that time, she and James among those who left to be replaced by new blood. Semchuk had gone off to the University of New Mexico, Holden was in Ottawa working for the exploration uh, program of the Canada Council. The spirit of generosity stressed by Semchuk was still hovering though, as was the collective character sketched in 1979 by director Patrick Close. Quote, we have a reputation for being stubborn and simplistic in our approach to matters. We can also be painfully honest and perceptive. These are the results of our prairie background and location, and they are not likely to change, end quote. Seen from a distance, temporal or geographical, local characteristics can be hard to discern. As with the process of institutionalization, so it's narrativization. As an institution story is written for one grant application after another, the burrs of its casting are smoothed out. This is why founders of cultural institutions are generally as popular as skunks at picnics. <laughs> with their malodorously idealized recollections of past conditions, improvised strategies, and paths not taken. That was then, this is now, is the usual put down of tedious pioneers, or simply TMI, too much information. <laughs> but when then comes around again, as is now happening, and cultural organizations are disappearing or being hollowed out to the point of dysfunction and ultimate collapse, it seems important to harvest some of the experiences that constructed the network of cultural organizations in Canada, and most urgently, to take a close look at those burrs, those tiny vestiges of the casting process that may hold the key to the reconstruction of Canadian culture in whatever form it will take post-Harper era government. As the founding director of the Canadian Museum of Contemporary Photography, now appropriated by and disappearing into the National Gallery of Canada, this kind of inquiry seems to me the opposite of academic, despite my current professorial appearance. The experiences of the group are highly informative in a number of respects. To begin with, the group's roots were sunk deeply into rural Saskatchewan, by which I mean both place and politics. They produced from that subject position. Here again, from a temporal or geographical distance, one might see their imagery as part of the larger North American movement back to the land. This is a misapprehension, as Semchuk insists. Many of them were from rural Saskatchewan and chose to stay there, at least for a while. And here comes the burr. For the key word in their vocabulary is not collective, commune, co-op, but cooperative, which they spell with a hyphen. As Lizitza and Semchuk explained, the social dynamic of the photographic organization that the group envisioned was governed by the codes and responsibilities of farming communities as they had evolved under the leadership of Tommy Douglas into the first social democratic society in North America. This nuance was heard and understood by their contemporaries. The chronology of artist-initiated activity in Canada 1939 to 1987, edited by A. A. Bronson, erroneously places the founding of the Photographer's Gallery in 1968, two years before the group came into being, but it gets the hyphen, as well as the spirit of the movement right, by calling it a cooperative. The entry also includes the information that Lorne Falk, the first director appointed by members of the gallery, quote, gradually transformed the co-op into a community resource center, end quote. This squares with what Semchuk remembers about the importance of serving a community, a position inherited from her father's connection to the Cooperative Com Commonwealth Federation, the CCF. 
Her political education began in her family's grocery store and continued on his political rounds. She visited farm families and First Nations communities, learning the importance of listening. Learning from each other is a recurrent theme of Jonescu Lizitsa's and Semchuk's memories. The circulation of knowledge is intergenerational, a handing down, and intragenerational, free exchange between women and men as equals. This is not to say that power relations had evaporated, but they were largely trumped by the impetus to pull together to learn and to thrive. Sources of information are remembered and honored. For example, there was Ruth, a.k.a. Curly Garson, who came from England with her husband, Dr. John Z. Garson, a medical doctor. She was already using a Roloflex for portraits and landscapes. Why were they in Saskatoon? Well, because they were socialists. They came to Saskatchewan because of the introduction of Medicare. Semchuk and Jonescu Lizitsa met at the University of Saskatchewan, where they were exposed to radical thinking and inspired with a sense of limitless possibility. They and their friends were greatly affected by student movements arising in France and elsewhere, by the philosophies and reformist programs of their professors, many of whom had been drawn to the University of Saskatchewan for its political community, and by the intellectuals and cultural leaders who spoke or performed at the university in the 60s and early 70s. Their fellow students were also engaged and gifted. This atmosphere is captured in the extraordinary university yearbook, Greystone 69, sitting on the table, which Semchuk edited. The photo editor and a major contrib contributor of images was her boyfriend and future husband, Richard Holden. As both she and Lizitza explain, the men in their lives were photographers before they were, the suggestion being that Richard Holden and James Lizitza, Lizitza initiated them to the mysteries of the darkroom. Semchuk recalls that their technical skills were phenomenal, as was their support. It was simply assumed that they, she and Sylvia, could master this technology because, as she says, we were part of a particular group. This was both a local and an imagined community in Benedict Anderson's sense of nationhood constructed from print culture, because much of their photographic experience came from books. When Semchuk first started turning the pages of Greystone 69, I could have sworn that I was looking at Call Them Canadians, or Ces Visages Qui Sont Un Pays, one of the three centennial yearbooks published in 1967 by the Still Photography Division of the National Film Board. This was no coincidence. Semchuk and her team studied the NFB book and sought to emulate its focus on intense experience and diversity, expressive, sometimes theatrical, photographic style, Mus muscular graphic design, including use of partial and full bleeds, and high quality printing. They treated the production of the yearbook as professionally as they could, including crediting and paying the photographers for the use of their images. The book included, includes creative writing, essays, and manifestos. In this context, the graduation pictures at the end seem almost a conceptual art project. <laughs> and given the moment in time, perhaps that is how we should read them. Some of the editorial choices may seem peculiar to us now. Were those inspirational words from, uh, from Ayn Rand's, the fountainhead, meant to be ironic? <laughs> In Greystone 69, all of the photographers, all of the photographers are men, and it is almost the same for the writers, the sole exception being Vera Petzer, a graduate of the university working there as an athletic counselor. Today, Dr. Petzer is chancellor of the University of Saskatchewan. Looking back at the late 60s and early 70s, Semchuk and Jonas Lizitsa grapple with the conditions of male dominance in cultural organizations of the day. Their consciousness raising ran parallel with the raising of their children, and it was not always a conscious consciousness raising, which is why the effort to look back combines both pride and embarrassment. Semchuk still marvels over the fact that she was entrusted with $60,000 for the production of the yearbook. 
but at the same time, she cringes over the leitmotif of the book, which is Holden's silhouetted female figure, an anonymous free spirit in the landscape. Change comes slowly, sometimes imperceptibly, then suddenly with authority, possibly across the gender divide. Semchuk credits Greg Kerno with encouraging her to become the president of the artist-run Forest, uh, Forest City Gallery when she later lived in London as a way of breaking the pattern of male dominance. James Lizitza occupies a slightly different position in the group's story because he was never officially enrolled at the University of Saskatchewan, but hung around photographing theatrical productions, auditing some classes, and helping to build a local photographic community. He and Sylvia moved to Quebec City after she graduated and were living there during the October crisis of 1970. They returned to Saskatoon with a series of documentary photographs that they felt should be seen. Those were the images that the Mendel Art Gallery rejected as too controversial, leading the group to seek alternative exhibition spaces. The group rented the display windows of a closed Eaton's department store, literally taking Lizitza's imagery to the street. They hung other projects in a laundromat and other places of encounter, with the idea of returning their work to its subject communities or showing uh, one neighborhood to another. In this, they were operating in the same manner as the Montreal collective Groupe d'Action Photographique, the GAP, and it is no accident that members of GAP were among the earliest visitors to the gallery. Part of the mission and an important source of revenue for the group and later the photographer's gallery was teaching photography. These workshops, as well as classes that took place in the gallery's second location in the Dowding Building, attracted new members. Grant Arnold, Patrick Close, Susan Close, Beth Foster, Cheryl O'Brien, and Doug Townsend among them. Some extraordinary encounters took place outside Saskatoon. Semchuk fondly remembers that Frances Robson came from Loon Lake to attend a workshop at Fort Sand. She was just 16. Living on a farm, very keen on photography, and already exhibiting the generosity of spirit that would be needed to keep the photographer's gallery alive. Recalling James Lizitska's approach to teaching, his insistence on starting with a self-portrait provides another indicator of the group's attentiveness to the personal as the threshold to a wider community, to representing the other, and also ties in with Semchuk's extended series of self-portraits, which she made to observe and communicate the traces of change on her face and body, and as we saw earlier in more literal form, to emplace these changes in community and landscape. As deeply concerned as the group and members of the photographer's gallery felt to their immediate environment, it is interesting to learn how profoundly committed they were to nation building. This work began at home, but spread out across the country. Through Ron Solomon, photo editor of the Still Photography Division of the National Film Board, they developed an affinity for the NFB mandate, their work embodying what Semchuk saw as the division's commitment to local stories. They traveled from sea to shining sea, they advocated for the recognition of photography as an art form, and they spread the gospel of their cooperative philosophy. This story breaks the habit of situating real change, which is changing mentalities, in the metropolis, the notion that change leeches out into the regions. Semchuk and Jonescu Lizitza report that they considered the photographer's gallery to be at the center, not on the margins of anything. And their confidence in this idea was repeatedly confirmed by visitors from Vancouver or Toronto who told them what a good thing they had going. For both of these women, there was momentum from within their families to achieve, and for over a decade, they perpetuated that supportive environment in their extended families, the group and the photographer's gallery. This encouraged their interest in other groups, leading to projects such as Jonescu Lizitz's work with the community involved in thoroughbred horse racing at Marquis Downs, but also kept their attention close to home, photographing family and close friends. In these arenas, they remained cooperative. They found ways of engaging their subjects in photographic process, using tools such as the cable release, both Janescu Lizitza and Semchuk did this, or simply by handing the camera over as part of the image, as James Lizitza did with his mirroring portrait self-portraits. Sylvia Lizitza is the nominal subject of many of these portraits, which are made up of two adjoining images on the strip. The first is Sylvia taken by James, the second is James taken by Sylvia. 
This is James Lizitz's work. The concept was his, and he initiated every exchange. The series is his mirroring of the cooperative spirit. Likewise, with Semchuk, who might cede the cable release to her daughter Rowena, but absolutely set the stage for these cooperative portraits. If the close intimacy of such photographic relations was sometimes criticized by outside authorities, and it was, it is this kind of work that remains meaningful to both Semchuk and Janeska Lizitza, who recalls how James Lizitza encouraged her father to make self-portraits during the late stages of his cancer. And early on, worth noting, the Photographer's Gallery exhibited the work of British photo th uh, phototherapy pioneer Joe Spence, of course we know died in 1992, and Semchuk visited her in England. This research is based on an interview, and the last few minutes of the interview were dedicated to present concerns and speculation about the future. Drawing on her childhood memories of listening to her elders, Semchuk explains how this predilection drew her closer to her Cree husband, James Nicholas, and continues to sustain her work, which is all about history, the history of the earth and people's history. People's histories. <laughs> Janescu Lizitza speaks of time, always a photographer's preoccupation, and the importance of taking time in our exchanges about art and life. She feels the influence of technology in separating individuals, making fewer moments of real community engagement, but some remain, and they continue to motivate her work in film distribution. Asked to transmit advice to the next generation of cultural builders, Janescu Lizitza says, Keep it manageable, and within the means you can control. Keep it nimble, otherwise your vision may be hijacked by the funders. And from Semchuk, the message woven through the story of her life is to acknowledge the grandmothers whose lessons can be regenerated in ways that are needed in the present for the future. Thank you.